to Israel now, where Canadian flights have been evacuating citizens and families after the deadly attack launched by Hamas militants last weekend. We're going to have more on that in a moment. First, though, the CBC's Paul Hunter went to one of the locations that Hamas militants attacked on Saturday, where at least 260 people were killed. It's a site close to the border of the Gaza Strip. This is the scene of that rave last Saturday where so many Israelis were massacred. The Israeli Defense Force has allowed journalists in today to look around at what's left, and it is, uh, it is almost indescribable. Even as we speak, there's what seems to be artillery fire. We, fighter jets have been going overhead. There's been explosions just off in the distance. It, we're very close to the Gaza Strip here, where Hamas came and killed. Everywhere you look, there are destroyed cars. There are bullet holes everywhere, broken glass, of course. There's blood in the sand still, all over the place, burnt out cars. What's striking is the scale. It goes on and on and on. There were so many people here, chased down, murdered. 260 people were killed here. The bodies have been taken away. Uh, this is so that we can see. The whole place is a testament to the horror of what happened. Everything trashed as all those lives were destroyed and ended. It is nauseating. Paul Hunter, CBC News, just outside the Gaza Strip. Paul Hunter reporting from Israel. Now, the first two Canadian flight evacuation flights took off from Tel Aviv today, bound for Athens. And more Canadian military flights are scheduled over the next several days. As Kate McKenna reports, officials say about 800 people have asked for assistance to get out of Israel. In a sea of people desperate to get out of Israel, this is a welcome sight for some Canadians in the crowd. We're sending these Canadians home, the tourists home, because we think that risk exists. This family got the call and packed up. We were um, at the um, lawyer's office and quickly finished that up, went home and picked up the luggage and came here. Additional airlines announced they're suspending flights from Tel Aviv, and officials say they've seen a surge in Canadians wanting to leave. More than 275 left today, after days of horror and uncertainty. Missiles were intercepted over, overhead, directly overhead, that we spent a great deal of time in the bomb shelter. And one of our sons was almost paralyzed with anxiety because of the situation and um, had to be reassured quite constantly. Robin Cox was in Israel for her nephew's wedding. <sighs> we were of mixed feelings because my husband's family are all here and we came for a very, very large and joyful celebration and we know that we're leaving them behind. Canadian officials say at least two flights per day will leave until everyone who wants to leave Israel can. But they say they can't help the 100 people in Gaza who've asked for assistance unless a humanitarian corridor opens. We are working very hard uh, with all of our allies uh, and, uh, and friends and partners who want to see peace returned to the region, uh, want to see civilian lives protected. This is an unbelievably difficult situation. Canadians have started to arrive in Athens on those flights from Tel Aviv. The government says it'll help passengers find hotels and book an Air Canada flight at their own expense. The first one is expected to arrive tomorrow in Toronto. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. A former Hamas leader is calling for a day of action, sparking concern any potential violence could spread, including here in Canada. Members of the Jewish community on the Lower Mainland are calling for increased security. While CBC News has no confirmation there is a threat to people here in BC, there will be police presence at synagogues and Jewish schools. In a statement, BC Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth says British Columbia will never be a place for hate, violence or the support of terrorism. We stand in solidarity with the Jewish community and we are here to support you. 
what we're hearing from community members around the threats is that this is another piece of the puzzle. We have to understand how raw and how in pain our community is and how much hurt. We, we lost an individual that went to school right across from where you're filming right now. I knew him. I sat with his family. We know these people. This is very intimate. Shankin says the community has not seen any direct threats of violence, but is advising caution. As we mentioned earlier, a former Hamas leader is calling for a day of action tomorrow. And some here in Canada are concerned. Jamie Strachan tells us how police are responding and their message for those stoking fear. Jewish communities in Canada and around the world are on edge. Our communities have spoken clearly that they don't feel safe and we are being responsive to that concern. After a former Hamas leader called for a day of action Friday, in Toronto, command posts set up in the heart of this predominantly Jewish neighborhood. As police in the city and across the country step up patrols, though they say there have been no credible threats. And in Montreal, the Jewish General Hospital is encouraging the cancellation of non-essential appointments. And hopefully, Montrealers, we can resist together to, know, to this, this hatred that is happening. Precautions are also being taken at Jewish institutions across Europe and the United States. Back in Toronto, police arrested three men, the hate crime unit now investigating after alleged threats outside of a Jewish school. I hope tomorrow will be an opportunity for us to test the safety and security that we feel here in Canada. Some parents with children at Jewish day schools are keeping them home Friday, but Maya Roth's four children will be in class. They need structure, they need a sense of normalcy during these times. Rabbi Jared Grover has been working directly with Toronto police. He says fear and anxiety are warranted, but he has been counseling resiliency. You don't cower, you stand up to bullies. I am sending my children to school tomorrow. I have young children in Jewish day schools. I'm encouraging my friends to send their children to school. The same concern in Muslim communities where police are also increasing their presence. The idea that you have to um, be protected as you simply go to a mosque for prayer is something that's it's, uh, it's not comforting, it's, it's, it's unfathomable, it shouldn't be happening in Canada. A shared emotion as a war happening a world away is felt in communities across the country. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Now, is the, as the Israel-Hamas conflict continues, the United Nations World Food Program is warning that supplies are running low in the Gaza Strip after Israel imposed a total blockade on that territory after Saturday's deadly attack by Hamas militants. The combined death toll of Israelis and Palestinians has now topped 2,000. The, to explain how the region got to this point and the context of trauma, CBC News spoke with Gabor Mate, a Hungarian-Canadian doctor and trauma expert. He's also a Holocaust survivor. He joined CBC's Stephen Quinn on the early edition this morning to share his point of view. The context is the longest ethnic cleansing operation in the 20th and 21st centuries. And the Palestinians have suffered such oppression, such brutality. Um, they've, tens of thousands have been killed by the Israelis since 1948. Um, children, hundreds of children have been massacred by bombs within the last 10 years, last 15 years. Um, the Israeli historian, or I should say sociologist, Baruch Kimmerling, called Gaza the world's largest concentration camps. And recently, 2,000 Israeli and Jewish academics around the world signed a paper saying that what's going on in the West Bank is apartheid. And none of that is reported in the Western press. So I was there with my own eyes a year ago. There's nothing to justify these atrocities that happened last week. But I'm telling you, if we're going to move forward, if we're going to create peace, if we're going to deal with all this trauma, we have to understand what's going on. And we have to understand that the Palestinian side has suffered such indignity that, and such oppression that, as the Israeli journalist Gideon Levy wrote in Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper, two days ago, is that you can't keep Plumian people mm -hmm. prisoner and not expect a cruel response. And that's the situation, and that's the context in which I, as a Jewish person, uh, who, you know, three of my kids spent a year in Israel and, and, and mm -hmm. studying. I've been there a number of times. 
I, I'm, I'm heartbroken for everybody. But at the same time, I just wish that people saw the overall reality. This did not have to happen. We have traumatic events like this, Gabor, that are just so deeply uh, politicized and, and, as you say, have uh, so, they're so rooted in, in history. It, it may feel as though one group is downplaying or diminishing the feelings of, of others because of, of their own views. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Unfortunately, it's true. I heard a um, wonderful Jewish academic and very religious Jew, Peter Baynard, um, talking the other day, and uh, he's also heartbroken, and he said that in his community, the way that Jews identify with each other is to be um, wishing violence and revenge on the Palestinians. And I'm sure the two same is true on the other side as well, for many people. It's so difficult for people not just to identify with their own particular ethnic group, but actually feel like human beings, feel as human beings. What if we woke up tomorrow morning, all of us, not as identifying as this, that, or the other, but as human beings? Mm. Would we do any of these things to each other? And the historical trauma is just keeps magnifying over there. And the outcome, the future is horrendous as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Unless, I and, and I have to tell you that um, I'm so mm, upset at Canadian politicians who just reflexively um, parrot the line that, you know, we have to support Israel's right to defense. Well, sure, every country has the right to defend itself. Mm -hmm. But does the country have the right to oppress and brutalize? And there's been 250 Palestinian deaths this year in the West uh Bank. The Western press does not report that. Yes, when you, when you talk about waking up this morning, I, I, could, I could not imagine waking up to um, rockets being fired into my neighborhood and getting the news that my children had been killed at a music festival or had been kidnapped and dragged across the border. It's horrible. And it's, one cannot but be uh, both outraged and, and heartbroken about it. Um, at the same time, do you hear when Palestinian kids are shot and killed in the West Bank, does the television show those reports? Do, the, do we go into, when Israel has bombed Gaza and has killed hundreds of children within two weeks, and I don't mean this time, I mean previously, do we go into Gaza mm -hmm. and hear the individual stories and laments of those individuals? So all I'm asking is for the truth that we should look at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Physician and trauma expert Gabor Mate speaking with the CBC's Stephen Quinn this morning. Now, as some Canadians flee Israel and others try to flee Gaza, many will, understandably, be traumatized by the violence. The Vancouver Association of Survivors for Survivors of Torture says it is always preparing to help those coming to this country. We spoke with the executive director in BC Today earlier this afternoon. He says the destruction in Israel and Gaza goes beyond those who are there. Are you hearing from any survivors of violence who are being triggered or, or impacted by what's happening in Israel on the Gaza Strip right now? Absolutely. And what yeah. are they telling you, if I can ask? Sure. I, I mean, how many anecdotes can we go into in a short mm -hmm. time? Not very many. But, um, you know, one thing that I can certainly share is that um, there is a sense of solidarity and there is a sense of empathy. Uh, among different people who have survived, uh, whether it's a terrorist attack um, or uh, decades of, of systematic oppression and exclusion um, from the benefits of, of, of the broader society that they live in, there is a sense of solidarity and of understanding and uh, and of connectedness. And that's one of the things that we find and that the research really backs up is that that actually really assists with the recovery and rehabilitation process is to have those bonds of solidarity. Um, not that somebody else's suffering makes us feel better, but that we can feel more connected and we can feel more of, of, of a link and more of a... Um, a collective movement towards healing. We have a, a phrase um, that we use in VAST, which is healing is an act of resistance. Uh, this refers not to uh, violent uh, or armed resistance, uh, because we would never uh, indicate that two uh, wrongs make a right or that uh, you know one war crime um, uh, justifies other war, war crimes. Um, however, that um, it's resistance against the processes that 
created the need for that healing in you in the first place. Mm -hmm.